This is the longest word in the English language. Pneumono ultramicroscopic silicovulcanoconiosis. It may initially appear as a long jumble of letters, likely because the first part of the word pneumono is rather unfamiliar to most people. However, as your eyes scan over the words, certain familiar parts may suddenly appear to you. You may see familiar words jump out at you like volcano, ultra, micro. The difficulty with wrapping your mind around this word originates from our inability to parse it into its component parts. Once we add spaces between these parts, the word seems much less overwhelming. If we understand that pneumono refers to lung, ultra to very, micro to small, scopic to either size or scope, silico refers to silica, volcano is volcano, and coniosis is a disease caused by dust, we can deduce that this word refers to a disease of the lung caused by specifically inhaling fine silica dust particles in volcanic ash. I should mention that this word is an artificial word. It was created deliberately to claim the coveted title of longest English word, but has since found its way into several dictionaries. So rest assured, you are unlikely to encounter it in your daily life. Other notably long words, such as deinstitutionalization, do not pose the same difficulties at all, since we are more familiar with the parts or morphemes that make it up. Institute, institution, institutional, institutionalize, deinstitutionalize, deinstitutionalization. We can recognize them, parse the word, and understand its meaning with relatively little effort, even if only familiar with the parts and not the word as a whole. To illustrate this ability, Take a look at this word that I just made up. Unlampify. What do you think this word could mean? You may not be confident of its exact meaning, but you're probably on the right track. For instance, you probably guessed that unlampify means to undo whatever the result of lampifying something is. You probably also know that to lampify something is to take an object and give it the properties of a lamp. So if I showed you this image and said, could you unlampify that bottle for me? I need something to put this flower in. You can understand perfectly well what I mean. That's because the internal structure of the word or its morphological structure contains a lot of information that you can use. You may not have known it explicitly, but the prefix un can only attach to verbs and creates a new verb meaning to do the opposite of the initial action, as in do, and undo. Similarly, the suffix if I can only function to change a noun into a verb. In the example unlampify, your understanding was implicitly guided by this understanding of the word's morphological structure. Following these rules, if I must attach to lamp first, creating the verb lampify, and then un must attach afterwards, meaning to reverse the action of lampifying something. Once you have this understanding of the word structure, it probably took you some additional conscious effort to construct a plausible semantic meaning of the word. But you got there in the end. We can represent this morphological structure in a tree format, which shows which parts attach to which. You can see that a hierarchical structure emerges, where if I first attaches to lamp, and then un attaches to lampify. Our minds are doing this kind of work behind the scenes every time we recognize a complex word. In fact, most of the processes that are going on are completely beyond our conscious awareness. Like is often done in psychology, we can illustrate this using an illusion. Take this made-up compound word, for example. Clampial. What do you think it means? What if I showed you the word with these two pictures along with it? What do you see? And now, what if I showed you these two pictures? At this point, you've consciously recognized two ways of parsing the word. You may have seen both from the beginning, but notice how now your perception of the word likely jumps back and forth. You either see clam peel or clamp eel, but not both simultaneously. This is similar to the famous Rubens vase illusion, where our perception of the image jumps from a vase to two faces, depending on which color we're perceiving the background and foreground to be. 
In words like clampial, our mind is jumping between two different morphological structures of the compound, one in which the morphemes are clam and peel, and another where the morphemes are clamp and eel. You'll notice, however, that words like chinaware, bookshop, overturn, and warplane don't cause you much trouble at all, even though each of these words can also be parsed as chin-aware. Books hop, overt earn, and warp lane. That's because our mind considers these alternative structures probabilistically. Since we have no experience with clampial, both alternatives seem equally likely. However, when it comes to words like overturn, though we may unconsciously see overt earn, we don't become aware of it because it simply isn't likely enough compared to much more plausible alternatives. It simply doesn't require our attention. Our brains are pattern detecting machines, so much so that we often see patterns that aren't really there. The same is true for morphology, especially when a given pattern is very familiar to us. Take this structure for example, verb plus er as in teacher, preacher, keeper, speaker, fighter, lover, dreamer, and so on. This pattern is so ubiquitous that we often see it when it isn't really there. You most likely know this word, corn. But how about if we add an ER, corner? Though you may never think about corn when you see the word corner, research has shown that we do subconsciously think about corn a little bit when we see the word corner. This is because for a split second, our mind erroneously parses corner into corn plus ER, even though we never fully become aware of the fact. In this video, we've looked at how our minds recognize patterns within words and use these patterns to construct meaning. These patterns are called morphological structure, and the parts that make up the structure are called morphemes. We also looked at how this system relies on probability to identify morphemes and morphological structures. In the next three videos, we'll go over three broad categories of morphology, inflectional morphology, derivational morphology, and compounding. If you have any questions or requests, please leave them in the comments, and thanks for watching.